was a lot of talk about change. There's this old saying, uh, the only constant in life is change. Uh, most of us don't like it, but we need to live with it. And ideally, certainly in business, but also in private life, we would like to control change. We want to anticipate it. We want to know what's in store for us so we can move it in a direction that is actual, actually leading to the kind of result uh, that we can live with. Uh, however disruptive change is, we want to understand it and at least shape it, if possible. And that is something um, that I would like to tackle now in this upcoming panel that has this beautiful title, Framework for Change. Um, and there's a lot of regulatory framework involved in that as well, but we'll get down to that in a bit. Unlike in the previous panel, I would like to start with our online speaker uh, and introduce her first. Our Emma Marce Gal Gagalia. Emma Marce Gagalia. There she is already. She's the CEO and chairman of uh, Marce Gagalia Holding, which is, uh, owns Italian steelmaker Marce Gagalia, and that's the world's largest maker of welded tubes, I found out on the internet. Emma, it's very good to have you with us. Thank you very much, and sorry for not being physically present with you, but I'm very honored to take part to your panel. Fantastic. And actually, there's a constant because in the previous panel, we also had somebody joining online. So it makes the investment into the screen even more worthwhile, Emma. So very good to have you with us. Thank I you. would also like to welcome Bjorn Kilmer. He's a private equity investor at Clayton Dublier and Rice that's in the United Kingdom. And he's partner and head of European Industrials. And there he is. And you can sit right next to Emma. Then I would like to welcome Werner Baumann, obviously chairman of the board of management of Bayer. And since January 2020, he's also the company's chief sustainability, uh, sustainability officer. Werner Baumann, there he is. I'm trying, I'm trying to follow the, the seating order that I can see here in front of me. And that means, last but not least, I would like to welcome Dr. Markus Kreber, CEO at RWE, which of course is one of the major German utilities of which he was CFO before that position. Very good to have you with us as well. There we are. Now, some of you may still have a fifth name in, in their program. If you do, Amparo Moraleda, a uh, member of the board of directors of Airbus, Marx, Keisha Bank, Vodafone, etc. Unfortunately, couldn't make it today. That was a very sort of last moment uh, notice uh, because I spoke to her beforehand and she was very excited to be part of this. But sadly, she can't be here with us. So we will make do with the four of you, which I think gives us still plenty to discuss. And uh, I already warned uh, Dr. Markus Kreber before uh, we went on stage that obviously, as a representative of uh, one of the big utilities, uh, this morning you probably followed it as well, the German energy minister. Uh, Robert Habeck announced also in a press conference that he's now uh, announcing translated level two of Germany's gas emergency strategy. Um, and even though that wasn't planned, I, I need to know from, uh, from Dr. Kreber, wh what does that mean for, for your utility? You already have enough on your plate. What, what does that mean? For us, it doesn't make a difference as a company. I think it was also well discussed what to do. And it's especially important to alert everybody in which situation we are in. Because this is the last level, the next level, we clearly say we have a physical shortfall of gas, uh, that's the third level. And that means that market prices, even the elevated prices we currently see, I mean, we talk about gas prices which are eight to 10 times higher than normal, cannot uh, solve and, and, and balance the market anymore. So this is the last level. And why is it important to do it now? Because we don't feel the pressure, we are in summer. And in winter, the demand for gas is twice to two and a half times what we have in summer because of the heating demand. So you can easily live during winter, uh, during summer, even without Russian supply. But the problem is then we are not filling our storages um, and we are not getting prepared for winter. So I think to make it very clear that this is a very 
difficult situation we are in and we don't know whether, the, whether we see further escalation. Um, and I not only mean about the terrific war in, in Ukraine, but also the economic war we are in. Because when we started sanctioning Russia, what they now do is, with, with all other arguments, but they are sanctioning us um, on the energy supply side. And uh, the very unpleasant situation we are in is um, we are dependent. So if we don't have a gas supply from Russia, I think we're going to live in a world which was unconceivable uh, 12 months ago. Uh, it will have devastating effects for industries um, across Europe, um, but also some households will feel it. Not only because of high prices, we actually talk about physical shortfall. And that was what Mr. Habeck made clear. The Dutch colleagues did the same. And of course, it triggers now action. Um, so we are unfortunately have to bring back old coal plants. I mean, we were on the path of a full transformation, not only as a, as a country, also as a company. And now coal needs to come back into the power sector because we have little power being used in the power sector and that needs to be saved. And therefore, we need to bring back coal plants. Uh, gas, fortunately, doesn't play a big role in the power sector in Germany, other than, for example, in the UK. So we need to save wherever we can. Mm. And that was triggered by this right. measure. But there, that is just a prime example of we're talking so much about sustainable transformation, about all the big business strategies that go hand in hand with it. And then suddenly something happens that was unforeseeable. Uh, and we have to go, not back to square one, but certainly take a few steps backwards uh, before we can go back onto the path that we were on, uh, which is an additional challenge. And I would like to actually start uh, with, uh, if you like, an opening round uh, you, for all of you, uh, and starting perhaps with Emma. I mean, when we're talking about the framework uh, for change, what is the biggest change that you and your company is currently faced with? Yeah, well, uh, well, the biggest change is, uh, first of all, what Marcus was saying. We went from a situation where the price of gas was 20 euro to a situation where now is 130. So, uh, of course, so we have like five times now on average the cost that we had before, which is a huge thing. The other thing is that uh, there is also lack of raw material. For example, in my business, uh, Ukraine and Russia were very strong supplier of, of all, of uh, iron ore, of, a B, uh, of a pig iron, of semi-finished product, finished products. Uh, we have a disruption of, uh, of value chain. So we are in a situation uh, where, of course, some of the signal were already present before the war for the pandemic, uh, supply disruption also before things about China and uh, the port of China all uh, um, uh, locked down. But now with the world, the situation has worsened. And uh, the idea is that we don't know what will happen. So there is a big uncertainty for the future. Uh, as Marcus said before, also in Italy, the situation is more or less the same. So we, we don't know if uh, you know, we will uh, have to also live with a shortage of gas and electricity. So this is a big, this is a very big thing. And uh, maybe also the other thing we see is that, uh, as you said before, the change is so fast and so uh, uh, uncertain. So the, the situation is really very uncertain. So you have to be very fast. You have to be very agile. Try to try to do your best also to adapt uh, mm. to such such difficult situation. Things also about, for example, 2020 minus 40 percent. Then end of uh, uh, 2020, a big uh, you know growth also part of uh, 2021. Now. We see the demand going down also now with also inflation and uh, what is going on. So the, the big difference is cost going up, uh, very strong uncertainty, uh, a problem of raw materials and very high price of gas. So right. we have to deal with that and also considering that we have to do the decarbonization. So we have to put all this uncertainty together with this uh, very strong strategy where we have to do and we feel the responsibility to work for a strong decarbonization in our economy. Right, right. Uh, that I would, the, the, the very last part again, basically all those challenges that you're faced with and at the same time having to basically manage that green transformation, if you like, we'll get back to that as well. Uh, but uh, Bjorn Kilmer, as, as a private equity investor, um, is there a big change? Is it a good one? Is it uh, one that you would rather not be faced? How would you describe the change that you're currently facing? 
So it, it's for sure a major change. Um, change always has short-term disruption and, and opportunity on the other side. Uh, you know, uh, one of the first things that happened this morning was a call to discuss, you know, level two of the gas emergency plan with some of our management teams. Fortunately, um, you know, we, we like Marcus see this as for now as a, you know, not a big change to what's happening, but a very clear warning that real change can be coming and, and to make sure our companies are as prepared as they can be for what is probably something we've not experienced in our uh, careers um, and, and, and really in the lifetime of our firm of over 40 years. O on the other hand, you know, we also think that change creates interesting opportunities. There is a need to invest, there's a need to reposition businesses to address shortages and, you know, for example, find a more intelligent way to, uh, to employ labor. All of that, I think, is, is actually um, helping private equity because we thrive where business fundamentally need reposition, I would say, as a broader industry, but in particular our firm really focuses on those kinds of situations. So we, we do see opportunities coming out of this as well and you know, actively rebalancing, I would say, as you would expect, our pipeline uh, towards those situations that are more driven by that and perhaps less driven, for example, by available financing, which has dramatically changed um, in the last few weeks. Uh, would you say change can also, uh, that kind of change, you know, offer opportunity? Emma mentioned uh, you have to be agile, agility. So a lot of the change that is happening so fast, can companies be agile enough to actually use them as an opportunity? Well, I think that's been a big topic of discussions of the previous speakers. I, I very much agree that, um, you know, uh, in creating an urgency and then having the cultural sort of background to embrace that change is sort of the key enabler. And, and, and I think there's a, there's a vast difference between businesses in, in that respect. We think of private equity as fundamentally a change agent. If I go to my partners and present a new investment, the fact that it's a great business only gets me to the table. The fact that we'll say we're making this investment will be up being able to articulate that that business, as good as it might be today, can be even better and can deal with the changes that might be coming its way in a good, good manner, right? So this is what we look for. And I think we've, we've a proven toolkit in helping improve that. You know, the alignment that our model creates, both economic alignment but also cultural alignment, I think has proven to be very powerful in, in driving really significant change. And it's, I think that, that we can contribute for selfish reasons, but ultimately, nevertheless, for societal benefit to the transformation that we're discussing here. Well, as, as long as the two, the selfish reasons and societal benefit go hand in hand, no problem, exactly. no problem whatsoever. Yep. Uh, Werner Baumann, Bayer, of course, being this big uh, chemical life science, uh, uh, and also for agriculture, you know, uh, this huge company, um, there, there are pro probably in, in each of the fields different kind of uh, challenges and changes that you're currently facing. Uh, which is the one that uh, gives you sleepless nights? I shouldn't say all of them, of course, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> None but of them. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, each of the businesses has uh, its own challenges uh, and uh, in situations of crisis also its own opportunities. If I go back over the last two and a half, three years, uh, we have uh, seen uh, you know, two of the biggest crises that I think the civilized world has seen since World War II. And uh, um, sleepless nights going back to two and a half years ago were all about how can we provide and be helpful in supporting the world with urgently needed vaccines. Uh, the change that has come about with uh, um, the end of February Russian invasion in Ukraine is that um, food security, national security, is now uh, at, in the center of the public debate. And it brings, uh, I think, forward how important it is uh, to ensure that we have resiliency in our supply chains, that we have uh, innovation that also drives a higher level of self-sufficiency uh, for food producers, that countries who can't get there on their own, have at least a certain level of self-sufficiency that they can get to. And with that, uh, also coming back to what the discussion was before, um, that, that very, very important role that we have as a company. Yeah, you said that we are a big company. Yes, we are. Uh, but uh, we are relatively big and relatively small in different areas. So we are relatively small, if you want so, uh, in the pharmaceuticals industry. But when it comes to egg inputs, so if you look at the supply of seeds, if you look at the supply 
of um, uh, crop protection products for plant health, we happen to be the biggest company in the world. So if we don't deliver, uh, the world cannot deliver uh, on you know, the mitigation of the crisis. And the world can also not deliver on one of the topics that we are going to come back to later, and that is in decarbonization of the mm. food chain. Yeah, yeah. So a uh, huge change that has come about, huge challenges, but also coming back to what you said, uh, Bjorn, huge opportunities uh, to make a real difference. I'll come back to that very, very soon. It's just because I sort of uh, hijacked uh, Dr. Krepper with my first question. I would like to give him the opportunity also to basically state his real challenge or the change that RWE is currently uh, facing the most. I mean, we are, we are maybe the mirror of the energy transition as a company, what we have to achieve as a society, and we use all potential tools, including a big corporate restructuring. If you look at the company 2016, 80% of our earnings were from uh, coal and nuclear. I mean, that was what RWE was known for. It was 80% Germany. If we exclude the current crisis, because it's difficult to assess what the earnings is, uh, consequences are, if you look at next year, it will be less than 5% from nuclear and coal, so from 80 to less than 5% within uh, six years, and it's only 15% Germany, so from 80% Germany to 15, and the company in the meantime has grown. We have done that with a 50 billion program investment program in renewables, um, the evolving hydrogen economy, storage technologies, big international diversification, and the challenge we have is we have 95% of our investments in the future business, but 50% of our people in the old business we have to phase out, and that's a huge stretch uh, for the company. One final remark, it's not that we came down to 15% in Germany because we wanted it, it's because nothing was built in Germany. Mm. We do every project in renewables which is possible in Germany, but the consequence was nothing was permitted I mean, stuck in court proceedings. That's why the share came down to 15%, and we had to spend the money uh, somewhere else. Money in the, well, in, the, in, in the end is not a problem for the, for, the, uh, for the transformation, because investing in renewables, you get the money wherever you want. I mean, that's not the problem. Yeah. Um, and I think here Germany has a, has a, has a, has a, has a catch-up task, and that's also one uh, root cause why we are in the situation we are in. It's not only that Putin turns off the tap, it's also that we have only discussed what we close, closing nuclear, closing coal, I mean, even attacking gas, instead of discussing how we bring the new technology as fast as possible into the market, because that will phase out the old by itself. So the, the discussion was wrong. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to bring to the attention of the sound people, and I think somebody's already on the way, that obviously there is some sort of uh, disturbance there. Perhaps we can give you a handheld mic, but because of what you just say, I know that RWE is very active when it comes to renewables. I've, I've looked at some headlines. RWE's largest battery storage project goes live in Ireland and not in Germany. Uh, and uh, RWE brings a 475 megawatt Swedish wind farm online. It's again somewhere else. Um, and uh, too much red tape in Germany, clearly. I mean, you, you was uh, quoted uh, a, a, at the hydrogen summit, uh, uh, Handelsblatt hydrogen summit, saying that we have to be more pragmatic and faster. Um, you also said that Germany can be independent from Russian gas by spring 2025. We have to obviously as we said, somehow bridge uh, the time in between. Do we need to be worried? Yes, because, look, I mean, and since we live in a de democracy and everything is discussed in public, you cannot avoid it, and nobody should be naive. We should not expect that, that Russia will look at us becoming independent from Russian energy supply and in the meantime supplying what is missing to get to the independence. I mean, that's not how it works. So. We have to, in order to defend uh, our way of living and to support Ukraine, we have to go through this pain. Or are we going to see by surprise, but that's not in our hands. I mean, we can do whatever we can to ease the pain, but that's more a political question, whether we see de-escalation, but that's not... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, talking of pain, I don't know if uh, the EU Green Deal is viewed as uh, a pain or a necessity. 
uh, and if it actually does what is necessary to do and allows you to do it. Uh, 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 Werner Baumann, for example, uh, uh, amongst the Green Deal, the EU wants to reduce uh, the use of pesticides dramatically. Uh, and also saying that especially agriculture um, and the use of pesticide contributes 10% uh, to the uh, entire uh, CO2 emission. Uh, that attack, oh, affects you. That was a Freudian slip there, attacks you. That affects your business directly. So um, is that something you say, yes, it needs to be done? Um, and is the, do you find the framework within which this is happening uh, conducive to, to a sustainable transformation of your business? So the answer to your last question is no. Uh, when it comes to your first question on um, uh, whether we see the world the same way in terms of the need to change, absolutely yes. Uh, we need to find other means, different modalities uh, to come to a better way of producing food and feed uh, because the current model is clearly not sustainable. Mm. Clearly not. Now, uh, what does that really mean? Uh, today, uh, we are stretched to the limits when it comes to food and feed production. Uh, we see it all over the world that uh, uh, weather catastrophes uh, on one side, uh, your political interventions on the other side, have uh, kicked the existing system out of balance uh, in a pre-crisis already kind of state of emergency where um, you know, food storage was at very, very low levels. Uh, now thinking about in this situation, yeah, doing something acute very, very quickly uh, to the reduction of pesticides yeah, or uh, other means uh, or uh, you know, the reduction of, um, uh, of the use of uh, a fertilizer, which in and by itself stands for about 4%, only fertilizer, 4% mm. of global energy consumption uh, would definitely be the wrong thing to do. Uh, we need to find that different way and that different way uh, is informed, uh, and come back to what was said earlier, um, by new solutions, and new solutions mean that we have uh, more. We have to have more innovation that comes to market quicker. That relates to my no to your last question. The framework that exists is not conducive to speed and quick regulation that looks at the opportunity. We have um, uh, the so-called uh, precautionary principle. Uh, that governs regulation, uh, that holds back a lot of innovation that could otherwise come to market much quicker, actually in a safe way in Europe. Mm. Uh, let me give you an example because your talk and code is always difficult. Um, you know, we have a pharmaceutical business as well, and uh, we started a company about six, seven years ago when we looked at what is potentially possible to change the paradigm going from the next better treatment to cure. Uh, looking at Parkinson, there hasn't been anything new on the market for patients who suffer from Parkinson in the last 50 years. Technology has come far enough mm -hmm. that we could give it a shot and we started that company. So we co-founded that company seven years ago. Where did we do it? In Europe or North America? Where did we do it? North America. We brought the technology and the approach to proof of concept. And we were looking at the first patients to treat with a novel cell treatment where you infuse modified cells into the brains of patients. Yeah? It's actually not reversible. Where do we think we got regulators to support that novel treatment? In Europe? or North America? In North America. We have 12 patients who have been treated, yeah, so all in the end stage of the disease without any hope. None of them Europeans. We are a European company with um, its foundation with the pharmaceutical business in Germany. We have people in our own um, uh, employee base who would die to get into the clinical trials, it's impossible here. Mm. So people are losing out because the regulatory system is not set up to take measured risks 
and then kind of take a regulatory approach that works in lockstep with the development of opportunities. Here, it's all about risk avoidance, <laughs> which kills opportunity, and with that, also kills the creation of ecosystems that we travel around the world to look at on how great things are. We go to Boston, we go to Israel, uh, you can go to China, uh, you can go to South Korea, you can go to the West Coast, and then we look at it and say, wow, it's incredible. But uh, we are not able, or potentially not willing, to do the same thing with very, very measured and limited changes to our regulatory system, which is actually a shame. Now, you speak there also from uh, the perspective of a listed company. I would like to know from Emma, um, which is a basically a family company that's sort of grown and grown, because uh, you also obviously operate, uh, you know, worldwide, and you face different rules, different regulations, different kind of red tape, different standards. Um, how or what is necessary from, from your perspective that your business can find a level playing field where you operate? Uh, who can provide it? Is it just the EU? Is it, uh, you know, is it at all possible? Yeah, so, well, first of all, let me say that I totally agree with uh, Werner. We have discussed several times during the B20 or in Business Europe about uh, this situation in Europe. So in Europe, uh, red tape is strong. Uh, the precautionary principle is there. Sometimes it's really difficult to innovate. Uh, and this you can feel. I mean, being, uh, of course, uh, an, a company with, you know, plants uh, uh, in different parts of the world, I can feel that. So there is a problem of red tape. For example, think about also the, the decarbonization. We are all talking about uh, having a, a, you know, a, a, an important percentage of new investments in renewables in Italy, but I think I understand the same thing in Germany and other European countries, due to permits, uh, it takes uh, three, four, five years to have you know, uh, renewables plants. So it's difficult also to go through you know, what we all need in terms of renewables. So uh, this is uh, something that we have to change uh, because I really think also if you talk about de decarbonization, the heart of what we need to do is to do innovation and we need you know, companies innovation. Sometimes also you, know, you, you, you were questioning before about the Green Deal. The Green Deal is of course uh, a good thing, but sometimes what we see is that uh, you know there is no a kind of uh, technological neutrality it's a top down thing where you say well you have to do that you have to um, finish with you know the traditional engine you have only to go to uh, electrical engine without maybe understanding that maybe you can go with hybrid engine and maybe have uh, clean fuels so what i want to say is that uh, sometimes in europe and also in the green deal you have uh, you know, the, the, the purpose is good, but the way you execute them is not fine. So you need uh, to have, uh, you know, more space for innovation, for companies' innovation. But going back to your, uh, your question, I also think that to have a kind of, uh, you know, uh, same situation, a level playing field, uh, I think it should be also important uh, to have uh, uh, better regulation, to have, uh, you know, for example, I would like to have the WTO to decide the, you know, uh, some multilateral, uh, multilateral regulation on, uh, on trade, on tariffs, on access to market, but we know that uh, this is not really functioning. So multilateral organization are not, are not function. Uh, for example, we also need to have more, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, FTA, so new, um, you know, new uh, trade, uh, um, new trade agreement, uh, for example, with the US, when I was the president of Business Europe, we tried strongly to have a transatlantic, um, you know, uh, um, uh, transatlantic uh, agreement with the US between Europe and US to have regulatory cooperation, we have the same standard, uh, to have less, let's say, uh, by American uh, staff, uh, but this was not um, had. So what I'm saying is that uh, Europe has to change, but also we should need to have more multilateral agreements where, you know, the same standards could be, you know, uh, in a, you, you can find as company, 
uh, same standards in Europe, in US uh, or in Asia, but this is not uh, working. And also on when you talk about uh, you know, green investment, uh, you have uh, different, uh, you have different uh, rules, uh, you don't have the same taxonomy. Uh, for example, we have an ATS here, we have uh, carbon pricing here, you don't have the same thing in US or in other parts of the world. So there is no a real level playing mm. field. And uh, this is also a problem for European companies. And sometimes uh, our rules are so strict and that uh, you know this is this could be a, a competitive disadvantage for 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 European companies, and so right. I think we should also work on that. So th this, if you like, the the European framework, it uh, it strangles innovation, from what I hear. Uh, it's probably set out and aiming for something good that we all agree with, uh, but it doesn't really enable you to turn that into reality. Uh, Bjorn Kilmer, today is the 23rd of June. Does that ring a bell? No, sorry. Today, six years ago, there was a referendum not far away from here <laughs> across, <laughs> across the channel. And I'm just wondering what's going through your head as uh, some a private equity investor based in the UK. Uh, when you hear about, uh, well, the flaws of uh, uh, the EU setup, well, a couple of things. Uh, first, going back to the previous discussion, I think it's somewhat ironic that uh, we're sitting here in the epicenter of the plant economy and discussing the failure of our own capitalistic system to, uh, to drive innovation, <laughs> which it depends. So, so I, I can't help to, uh, to point that out. Um, but coming back to your question, um, you know, we think actually the um, UK's critique of the European Union has a lot of merit. And it is very unfortunate that there wasn't a better dialogue from both sides, frankly, to engage in the substance of this debate, which entails some of the elements that we're discussing here. You know, more liberal, more flexible regulation, more focus on letting ultimately the market decide outcomes, but setting boundaries that, um, you know, uh, control it. Um, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate that this sort of became a populist and, and, and polarized political debate and, and I think from today's perspective, I don't think it's easily reversible. And I think the UK is living to see, you know, um, just how far reaching that decision is and how difficult it is, frankly, in today's world, which is very complex to um, operate as a single country. It sounds great to have, uh, you know, Singapore on Thames, but, but you know, <laughs> it is a lot more complicated in reality when you're integrated into energy supply in Europe, food supply in Europe, um, you have, you know, close trading relationships. And so, you know, um, we, we follow this closely. It doesn't doesn't make it easier to invest, but again, it, it will also create opportunities because it, it re will require, for example, more service businesses to support you know businesses in in managing these complexities, notably on trade and logistics, for example, as, as one element of focus. So ultimately, you know, we, we're an economic actor. We, we we don't make and don't want to make political decisions. We we sort of uh, um, you know adapt to the ones that are being made, and and this one I think was ultimately made and made legitimately, one has to say. One can debate whether it's a good or bad decision, but I don't think you can really debate that it was endorsed by the electorate in a, in a proper way. And so we should move on and, and try and make the best of it. And, and one element I would say is I sometimes miss from the European side um, a spirit of that, a spirit of this has happened, let's make it work as well as we can, as opposed to let's make it difficult so the next guy doesn't come along and does something similar. Werner. Yeah, may, maybe I can latch on to what, what Bjorn said. Uh, there's, there's an interesting quote uh, that uh, uh, I'd like to share of um, the um, uh, British Secretary of Ag. Uh, there's a uh, new legislation that was just brought uh, into Parliament about the deregulation of uh, new gene editing modalities. Uh, most of you know about CRISPR-Cas, yeah, where you kind of go into precision modification of the genome, something that you can do you know, also with traditional reading, but takes much longer and is much less accurate. And the quote goes as follows. Now that we have left the EU, we can go back and follow the science. I think you don't have to say more. Yeah. Very damning. Uh, let's try and turn this around again slightly before the mood sort of disappears <laughs> down in the deepest cellar. Um, Björn, when you were listening to, to Werner and um, uh, Marcus about the 
challenges they, they're facing right now, while at the same time trying to do the right thing, namely, you know, promoting renewables, really investing in renewables, getting that up and going, uh, finding cures for disease, making sure we get food. Um, all of that is part of a sustainable transformation. Is there anything that they're missing? Because that is part of your job, isn't it? To also help companies uh, to do the right thing, also in order to be more attractive than to investors. Yeah, sure, I'd say two things. One is in terms of, you know, this is a very difficult job to do, and that in itself creates opportunity for us, because, you know, in, in doing this well, you're naturally drawn to focus on your core business, and you make decisions about what might not be in the absolute core. And, you know, the environmental science business that uh, Bayer sold is a good example of this, right? It's a really good business. No doubt Bayer could, you know, keep going with this for a long time, but I think it's chosen, in my view, rightly, to focus on its bigger, more important businesses and let the transformation of that business, which, which has all the topics we just discussed, by the way, uh, in terms of exposure to regulation, ESG and so forth, but, but is fundamentally an absolutely necessary product for food supply uh, and, and, and security, frankly, um, be done by private equity, right? So that's, I, I think, uh, one element of this. You know, the, the other one is, you know, looking at this more from the perspective of our own businesses, we think it's really important that the strategy of our businesses is driven by each business individually and that it, that it sort of transcends in some ways our uh, partnership with the management of this business as an owner. While it's a very important episode, hopefully, and hopefully medium term, at the end of the day, it is transitory. And it's crucial that, you know, both in terms of sustainability, but also ESG, each business has really a, a deep-rooted belief in what it is doing that can be, you know, as, as we said earlier, not just good for it, but good for the world. Mm. And when that comes to play, it's extremely powerful. And let me just give you one very tangible example of this. You know, I was in, in our kitchen the other day in the office, and one of my partners came back from South Africa where they just had the annual management meeting of one of our portfolio companies, a company called Belron, that most of you have probably not heard of, but which is the world leader in windscreen glass and repair. And it sort of, you know, has done very well, and, and amongst other things has done well for the original founding family, which remains the CEO and the, you know, my, you know, small shareholder. And because of that South African heritage, they sort of strongly engage, you know, around the notion of being a good citizen of the community, and particularly around doing something in South Africa. And so they, you know, they have a really deep culture of sort of, you know, their management team actually driving the change. And, and one very tangible thing they did is they had the UK IT department help black kids in South Africa that don't have a school to teach them IT skills, basically. And so the first cohort of this class has graduated. There were 60 kids in the class, 44 graduated, 38 have a job. Uh, by reference, this cohort would normally be 70% unemployed. In, 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 you know, kids that look like this, if they didn't have this, that's what would happen to them. And of the 38, 26, are the, are the sole breadwinner of their families, right? So, you know, he came back and was really inspired. And, and I think it's a great example of mm. sort of businesses having found their true core, having a deep sense of mission that doesn't have anything to do with us. We support it, of course, but, you know, it is driven by them. It is, it is intrinsic to who they are. And that's what I think is so you know, important ultimately to drive change because right. it comes back to culture that, you know, if you have that belief in your leadership that they're doing the right thing, then you can drive change. And of course, every big listed company, and I'm sure, I, I think I've, I've even looked it up on Bayer and RWE, you have your own ESG departments, making sure that all of that uh, is taken care of. You told me you have to leave on the dot. It is on the dot. And I haven't looked in your direction. Very quickly, one question. <laughs> now, there we, oh yes, yes, somebody, somebody, keep it short. Yeah, thank you, Ricardo Cocchini from Audi. Um, well, when talking transformation, we're basically talking a symphony, right? Where each and every player has to strike the right note at the exact right time. What we observe, however, considerably often, is that there is a coordination problem wherever transformation is. Think of e-mobility, charging infrastructure, and green energy production, for example. So what do you think is the good balance when it comes to private initiative coordinating itself, so to say, and regulatory bodies trying to bring the players all together. Do me a favor, pick one to answer. 
Well, I would say RWE, given <laughs> some Okay. <laughs> I, I have a very clear answer. So, I mean, in general, I would say what we need from the politicians or the policy setter is a clear regulatory framework which is stable. And, and that's a problem because some of the politicians think you can change things within five years' time. In the business we are in, I mean, you have typically investment cycles of 30 years, and when you change something today, you're going to start seeing it in five years. So you need some kind of stability. So give us a stable framework, and then the companies will operate. Where we also need the government in is in the infrastructure, because infrastructure is not being built other you, you allow in mon monopolies. If you have a monopoly and some have it, like when you look at the transmission line operators in the Netherlands, they have a monopoly, state-owned, there you solve the problem. If it's not state-owned, if it's market-oriented, then you need to organize the infrastructure. Building a hydrogen network in Germany will never come out of private enterprises because you cannot solve the hand and egg problem. Who will, pick, who will take it off and who will supply it when it's unclear when the pipeline is ready and that has lead times of... Uh, five to ten years. So infrastructure by the government, framework. The rest can be done private. Fantastic. <clears throat> thank you so much for that question. Well done. Big thank you to Emma, Björn, Werner and Markus. Wherever you have to go, I hope you get there on time. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you.